Hey, y'all. Welcome to the first public video would be the better way to put it. There are some videos that are unlisted of my YouTube channel. Uh, thank you guys for clicking on this and watching this interview with Shane Beamer. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, the, as this channel grows, the video quality is going to go up. The audio quality is going to continue to go up. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing to do cool things like this and, and bring interviews to this page that people are going to be interested in, that people have showed interest that they, you know, about what I do, about what we do on the Inside OU podcast, on, on social media, um, on Twitter. Um, and, and you'll find this interview in, a, in our podcast this Thursday on the Inside OU podcast. You can subscribe to that in the link underneath. And this full interview has been up for three to four days on our Patreon page on patreon.com slash inside underscore OU. And that link is also going to be underneath. So thank you guys again. This is a great interview with Shane. Uh, he's, a, you know, he's a, not just a quality coach, but he's an even better person. And you're going to see that here. Um, to the South Carolina people that are going to watch this, we didn't get too in-depth with South Carolina. It's going to be a tough transition. He, he gets into it a little bit. But um, I want to point out a couple things, and I did at the very end. All 11 assist all 10 assistants that he's surrounded himself around or, or have NFL of uh, NFL resumes and as well as Marcus Satterfield as offensive coordinator has been with Joe Brady, who has been right up there with one of the best minds in college football. And those things are plus he knows what he's doing. He's surrounding himself with quality assistance and uh, putting South Carolina in the best position to be successful here in the future. So thank you guys again for clicking on this, wanting to watch this. Um, hopefully you guys subscribe to this channel. Um, I'm looking forward as it continues to grow and hope you enjoy the interview. And from both sides of the spectrum, there's some things I'm sure they'll want to know about from Georgia's standpoint that we were doing, but there's a lot of things that we as a staff, offense, defense, and special teams felt like uh, Oklahoma was doing that was really, really good that I want to learn from as well. We have not had too many injuries tonight, which is a good sign, but the one injury has been significant to Shane Beamer, one of the assistant coaches for Oklahoma. You might notice he has got stitches above his left eyebrow, pretty good egg on the noggin. That's because he wasn't very smart, and after Jeremiah Hall, his H-back, scored the first touchdown of the game, he decided to headbutt him with his helmet on. Unfortunately, Shane did not have his helmet on, so the coach does have an injury tonight. Steve Fink, and I'm the Assistant Athletic Director for Communications here at the University of South Carolina. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's press conference as we formally introduce our new head coach, Shane Beamer. So without further comment, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce the head football coach at the University of South Carolina, Coach Shane Beamer. Thank you, Coach Tanner. Thank you, President Kaslin. It's an absolute honor to be the head football coach here at the University of South Carolina. Today is an absolute dream come true, not just to be a head football coach in the Southeastern Conference, but to be the head coach at the University of South Carolina. In my dreams, I wasn't staring at a screen of uh, reporters on Zoom, and we had a big room with uh, my family and so many people in here, so that's a little bit different, but it certainly doesn't take away the excitement of being here in this position. I We are now joined by a special guest, and I want to thank him greatly because this is awesome. Um, joined by former Oklahoma assistant, now South Carolina head coach, Shane Beamer. Shane, thanks for coming on. Like I said, this is awesome. No, thank you for having me. It's awesome for me as well. Enjoy, uh, enjoy following you and your work and do a great job. So thrilled for me to be on with you as well. Yeah, first off, you know, we were just talking beforehand. So family's not out at South Carolina quite yet. How is this, how's the, how's this whole transition? How's this all going for you? Uh, professionally, it's been busy, you know, really good uh, from that standpoint. Uh, every day is an adventure, learn every day, and a lot of things you don't expect that you're learning as you sit in this chair for the first time. But uh, personally tough, just because family's not here with me. And um, it's funny, my, my, uh, my wife and my son, 
they came out uh, this week, right, as the snowstorm was, was about to hit there in Oklahoma. And my two daughters, they didn't want to come. They wanted to stay in Oklahoma because they're like, we don't know if we'll ever see snow again if we live in South Carolina. So they definitely got all they wanted and then some by staying out there this week. But they're moving here in a couple of weeks. So I'm eager to get them out here. But, the, you know, the transition has been good. Thank God for FaceTime and, 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 and all the other different technologies that are out there. Yeah, and that's right where I wanted to start with you because we did have, luckily for me, one, I did an interview with an NFL guy earlier and the Carson Wentz trade happened 10 minutes before, had the interview scheduled for you today and the recruiting dead period gets extended to May 31st. I just want to get your overall thoughts on this. And I, I know Lincoln's voiced his frustrations before with it. Um, just where were you at with this, with the dead period getting extended and what do you hope to happen in June? It's, you know, first of all, I mean, obviously the, uh, health and, you know, first of all, the health and, and safety. <laughs> You're good. Sorry, it keeps going out. I got a black. Can you see me? No, we got you. Okay, sorry, kept going in and out. It was a black screen. All right. Um, yeah, first of all, I was going to say that the health and safety of everyone affected by the pandemic is our priority and forced, and, and we got to get our country under control and all that as well. But from a personal recruiting standpoint, I think it's terrible. Um, I think there's a sense that, well, you were able to recruit virtually, virtually last year and everything went great. So should be able to, and everything's the same. And it's not the same. I mean, last year when things got shut down, we were so far ahead on that class of 2021 that you had been in their high schools. You had seen them play their most recent season. They had been on your campus. Now, I mean, we're recruiting guys, South Carolina, Oklahoma, we're all on the same page. There's a bunch of guys that have never been to Norman that have scholarship offers or never been to Columbia, South Carolina that we've never met. It's only been over Zoom. And, and that is, uh, that's certainly tough. And, and especially being a new head coach and new staff, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of excitement uh, here. And, and, you know, to be able to get guys in this building and, and around us as coaches is something that we'd love to be able to do right now. And we're not able to, but you know, it is what it is. Um, don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, we're, we want to be, uh, take all precautions and be smart in everything that we do. But I do believe it's time for guys to be able to come back on campus as long as it's done with the, the right protocols. Uh, but again, the health and safety of everybody is our priority. And that's what we're most, it's most, what is most important. And then in June, you know, I would hope they'd open it up and ideally we can have some camps on a limited basis where kids can come to your camp. But if anything, just where they could come to your campus and visit and you can get them in the building and, and they can get around you and we can get around them. Yeah. So obviously at Oklahoma, you guys did a great job with the virtual visits and how you guys dealt with, you know, the inability to see these kids and get them on campus. What, what are you, what was, did you take away from that experience and how are you going to use some of that to what you do now at South Carolina in terms of how you're virtually visiting and visiting with these kids? Yeah, I know. I thought it was fantastic. I thought what Annie Hansen and Zach Heffley and all those guys at Oklahoma uh, came up with as we put together those virtual visits and it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, we, we started doing them in whatever that was April, May, whenever we started and did, so many of them and I thought we did a great job of just constantly evolving and trying to make it better as we went forward and South Carolina was doing them when I got here there were certainly some ideas and things that I wanted to implement very similar to what we did at Oklahoma that that we've done and and I think like anything it's just being creative like everybody in America right now are doing these virtual visits well how do we separate ourselves from Clemson or North Carolina or Georgia and Oklahoma, whoever else we're recruiting. And we've got something unique here uh, in this university in this football program that we're trying to sell that as much as we can. And, and uh, uh, you know, we just, I just got out of a staff meeting and we were talking about that. How do we continue to make these better? Cause it's going to be the name of the game here for at least a few more months, obviously. Yeah. So I want to stick with Oklahoma here for a sec before we get to finish up with South Carolina. You, as I, as, as you know, huge fan of the H back room at Oklahoma. How happy are you with the way you left it? I mean, they, you've got a guy like Mikey Henderson that, you know, who knows how many snaps he gets this year, but it may not be enough. And just how tough was it to get snaps for everyone? It was uh, really hard. Um, you know, I think about it and you know, this from following us. I mean, I got hired in 2018 and it was Carson Meyer, maybe played, 
I don't know, 30 snaps a game, maybe. And then Jeremiah Hall that year would maybe play, I don't know, five to 10. Uh, and then you go into this year where we basically had two of those guys on the field, like at all times. So just the way that we were able to evolve that room, obviously give credit to Lincoln. It was a great tool for me or learning tool for me to see how, you know, every year that offense was different with Kyler to Jalen to Spencer and how we were different, not necessarily schematically, but always trying to stay one step ahead and evolving as an offense was good for me to see as a coach. And then it's just, it was really hard because you're looking at it. They all have such, all four of those guys, Mikey, Jeremiah, Braden, and, and Stog, they all got unique skill sets and they're all more than capable of playing, you know, being a 50, 60 play a game guy, but there's not that many reps or catches to go around. And, and I give credit to them. I mean, it was such a, they're so unselfish. They're such great kids. They support each other so well. Uh, that was as excited as I was about getting this head coaching opportunity, it crushed me to leave those guys. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here, I got one of those digital picture frames right here on my desk. And there's more than one picture of just us together, me and those yeah. guys and uh, uh, care about them, love them, always will. And, and certainly they'll have no bigger fan than me uh, going forward. Yeah. Do you, have you talked to him much since you like, how are you ma maintaining contact with those guys? I know you're busy, but. Yeah, no, I want to. It's so tricky. Like, don't get me started on certain rules that we have in college <laughs> football, but like, technically, it's a violation if I called sure. Jeremiah Hall just to catch up on them. Like, I wanted to reach out to some of them today just about the snowstorms in Texas and how they're doing. And I'm like, I mean, Lincoln knows I'm not trying to recruit them to Oklahoma, but it's just you, there's a fine line there as well. But we've kept in touch a little bit. It's funny, Jeremiah's. Jeremiah's high school coach is actually a high school coach here in Columbia now. So he can, kind of keeps me abreast of what Jeremiah is doing. And, and uh, they've shot me some text messages off and on and, and called just to get advice on, on things and things like that. So I'll always be here for them. They're busy. I'm busy. But uh, they know how I feel about them. And, and uh, I know how they feel about me as well. My kids, they, they, don't, quite, they don't quite understand the transfer portal and all that <laughs> stuff. So when I got the job... My son was like, now are Stog, Braden, Mikey, and Jay Hall, are, are they all coming with us? And <laughs> I, had to, I had to tell him that's not quite how it works. As much as I'd love for that to happen, I don't think that's going to be a possibility. Yeah, it's this time of the year, the NFL draft's coming up. And I, I just wanted to say this to you. Watching the Super Bowl, I, my phone kind of lit up with two to three text messages immediately after Rob Gronkowski caught his touch, first touchdown. Freak incident with Stogner this year. Um, obviously, something that may never happen, hopefully for his sake or anybody's sake, never happens the way it did. But where do you see him? Is he, is he that kind of type, like a Rob Gronkowski, go to the NFL, you know, inline tight end, can flex out, physical guy? How, how do you see his kind of NFL draft prospectus? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's just – he's a guy that he took – everything being shut down last spring and really utilize that time to get better. Like he was talented already. He came back such a different player when he came back to school in the summertime from a speed standpoint, athleticism, route running, such a competitor and tough guy. I mean, he's just, football is very important to him and he works really hard and he's tough and he's got uh, uh, ability. So that's a great combination as you know. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the balls that he caught this past season was something that we took from the Patriots that they did with Gronkowski, just that little pop pass or whatever you want to call it over the middle where we pull the guard and Stog made a living on that. And he's such a, there's a lot of big tight ends out there, but there's very few big tight ends that can go out there in space and, and run the routes that a receiver does. And he can do that. I think the sky's the limit for him. He was having such a great year before he got hurt against uh, whoever that was, Kansas, Kansas. I think. Um, and such a freak injury. Felt so bad for him. But, man, I was so happy to see him be able to come back and play some in the Cotton Bowl. And, and I know he's on, on a mission going into 2021. So, funny enough, I ran into Joe Castiglione a couple weeks ago. And uh, we got to talking. And he, we brought up – we started talking about Shane Beamer. <laughs> and he mentioned about the relationship that you two guys had. And we've heard, you know, prior to Lincoln becoming a head coach that, that he was being groomed behind the scenes to be a head coach. And he kind of mentioned the same conversation with you. How did Joe help you get into the, you know, chair you're in now to be confident 
in the chair you're sitting in. How, what, what did Joe Castiglione do for you? So much. Uh, he's probably glad I'm gone because I was such a hemorrhoid to him. Uh, <laughs> just pestering for three years, probably. No, he was fantastic. And that was a big reason that I wanted to come to Oklahoma. I mean, there were a lot of reasons, Lincoln Riley being one of them. But Joe C. was another one of those. Just He's, he's so well-respected across our college athletics in his role as a person and an administrator. So I just felt like the opportunity to learn from him and be around him and be around a phenomenal athletic department like OU was a great opportunity for me. And, and Lincoln actually mentioned that when I was talking to Lincoln about the job about how Joe helped Lincoln kind of prepare for when Lincoln became the head coach. So I just, I don't know if I was supposed to or not, but I just dove right into it. And <laughs> it started out as uh, Joe, uh, inviting me to come to his office and, and sitting down and uh, just talking in his office. And then that kind of evolved to where we would go to lunch and just take a couple hours and just, you know, talk. He was, uh, at the time, he was serving on the college football playoff committee with my dad. So we were able to talk about my dad a little bit. But a lot of it was just me asking him questions. You know, when you hired Ryan Hibble, you know, why did you hire Ryan Hibble? What did you see? Talk about when you hired, you know, back in 19, whatever it was, 98, 99, when you hired Sherry Cole, what went into your thought process then? And that was a great learning tool for me and, and resource. And uh, I can't say enough great things about Joe and, and how good he was to me, not just, you know, while I was there, uh, since I've been here, and then just the help he was willing to give me as this process with South Carolina was taking place. You, now you're in a situation and getting to the South Carolina side of this. Now you're in a situation with Ray Tanner, who's been the athletic director at South Carolina since 2012. They just hired a, a quick research on this one, but just hired a new president that's got a ton of prestige with him behind him from Army, I believe. Is that how would you have taken the South Carolina job if those things weren't in place? Because I know that's probably something that's important to you. Yeah, you, you better have alignment from the top down uh, anytime you take a job because you can have – it can be a great place and a place you've always wanted to be, be but if, if you don't have the resources and the support to go in, you're going to be looking for a job in about three years. And, and I felt that here. I love the fact that President Caslin, our president, uh, not just came from West Point but played football. He was an offensive lineman at West Point in the 70s. Uh, and then the fact that he was a three-star general in the military, was in the Pentagon on 9-11, I mean, just a fantastic story. He loves football, and he wants athletics to be successful here. And Coach Tanner was the baseball coach when I was here before. So I, I knew him, didn't know him well, but knew him well enough. I um, mean, he was winning back-to-back -back national championships in baseball with guys like Whit Merrifield and Jackie Bradley Jr. And, and he knew what it took and to be successful and he's a he's a sports guy uh, so to have those two guys here with me is a uh, huge resource and, and thankful that they're uh, that they're that we're on the same team that's for sure I have to ask you this because funny enough the SEC is moving towards a pass heavy offensive driven league which is a complete 180 from what we've seen the last decade what it, just overall thoughts on that and the direction? And it's funny you're leaving a conference that now has I, what I would assume as four or five of the top ten defensive coordinators in college football, maybe top fifteen with Heacock, Grinch, Ronda, um, Quitkowski now at Texas. But now, what is just your overall thoughts on the kind of landscape change in terms of now you're heading to the SEC? You, you have this idea of what it takes to score. I know I asked the offensive coordinator, Brian, I forgot his last name from Florida about this, but mm -hmm. you know what the pressure is like to have to score on every drive. And now you've seen the also the other side of it with Lincoln to where, okay, he now has a defense. I can run in on third and nine and punt it and get a team back inside the five yard line like he did against Iowa State or mm -hmm. at other times during the season. Just how, how did your time at Oklahoma kind of prepare you to go into a league now that, there's going to be games where you're going to have to score on every drive to win. Yeah, no, I've seen every end of the spectrum like you're talking about. <laughs> and it is, uh, it is different. And uh, certainly things kind of evolve and go full circle. And I, and I think every year is different. And, and each year you've got to figure out what are the strengths of your offense, defense, special teams, and, and accentuate those. And 
you know, like we talked about before, Oklahoma's offense in 2018 was different than 19. 19 was a little bit different than 20 with the different quarterbacks and skill set that we had and how we use guys. But no, I've certainly got experience in, you know, when I was at Mississippi State early in my career, we were struggling to score 17 points a game to Oklahoma where we're scoring 50 a game to this past season where the defense comes along with Alex and it's a different way to play. So certainly seen different ways to get it done. And, and it is fascinating to see how the SEC is different uh, in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, you better be able still to run the ball and stop the run. And, and I was just looking at the other day, statistically, like the top teams in the country. If you look at like run defense uh, across the country in 2020, it's basically a who's who of college football, the, the heavyweights uh, from last season. So to me, that showed me that, yeah, maybe a pass happy league, but in the, the day, you still better be able to run the ball and stop the run. Yeah, a lot of people, Shane, didn't realize that Najee Harris was a big load to deal with from Alabama and everybody focused on the passing game. But that's just, that's beside the point. I won't go too deep on that topic. But uh, you were a part of the last staff to go at South Carolina to go to an SEC championship game. They went on to win 11 games a year the next three years after that. Obviously, the place where South Carolina is at now, I don't know how many signees you guys ended up with. I saw it was at 11 at one point. Um, kind of a tough situation to go into. What, what's, what's it going to take to get South Carolina back, you think, to that SEC, competing in the SEC East and getting to that championship game? Yeah, when I got hired, it was a small signing class. We kept those guys because I think we signed 10 or 11 in December, which allowed us to have 10 more scholarships to utilize in January. So it gave me a chance to get in here and kind of see where we are as a team, what we need, where are we lacking, and then go attack that through recruiting, through the transfer portal, uh, through different aspects of that, and we were able to do. But, you know, to me, it's recruiting. We, we uh, There's some good players here. I mean, there's guys that are in this program right now that we wanted at Oklahoma. There's guys in this program that we wanted at uh, Georgia. So uh, there are some good players. We've just got to increase our depth. We've, we've had some attrition since I got the job, whether it be guys going in the portal, guys leaving for the NFL. Uh, we're really, really dangerously thin at some positions that we've got to recruit our way out of. And um, it's not easy to do that in this state. It's a small state to begin with. There's not a there's not like it's not like the state of Texas and Georgia where you've got Division One Power Five guys left and right. There's a small handful of them, uh, less than ten usually each year in this state. Uh, but I saw when I was here before we were able to recruit guys from South Carolina like a DJ Swearinger, like a Stephon Gilmore, like an Alshon Jeffrey, a Jadavion Clowney, like a Marcus Lattimore. So you've got to be able to try and keep the best players in South Carolina at home. And then we were able, when I was here before, to go into North Carolina and get a Melvin Ingram out of the state, a Chris Culliver, uh, go to Georgia and get a Connor Shaw. So there's, there's, uh, there's enough players around to, to recruit here. We've got a great school to sell academically. We've got a great football program to sell. And we just got to kind of keep, I know it's cliche, but just kind of keep chipping away and get a little bit better each day. But uh, we've got a brand new facility that we're in that I'm doing this interview from that was built two years ago. That's a standalone football facility that if there's a better one in the country, I want to see it. Uh, so we have the resources here uh, in place. And as a matter of fact, I had lunch last week with the husband and wife at this building that I'm in is named after. <laughs> like, look, there's, there's no excuses. Like I heard, that, <laughs> heard that we needed a football facility to win at the highest level. Well, I gave you one. So don't tell me we don't have what it takes. So it's a, it's a fan base that has high expectations. And so do I. And I'm excited about that. I got three quick hitters for you. I'll get you out of here. All right. All right. One, Oklahoma in 2021. Why did you, I'm kidding. Oklahoma's got a chance to win a national championship in 2021. Most complete roster. Um, what, what, you, you feel that way about Oklahoma heading in the next season? I do. Um, you know, just the way that we finished the season, the young players that came along, the recruiting class that's coming in, the guys that decided to come back for another year of school. Uh, it's a great group coming back. But, you know, Lincoln will be the first to tell you just because it looks good on paper uh, doesn't mean it's going to happen. I mean, it, just like every year that I was at Oklahoma and then every year before that, you're Oklahoma. So you got everybody gunning for you you're going to get everybody's best shot so you've got to stay healthy uh the leadership has to come along uh but obviously you got a fantastic coaching staff and a lot of great personnel returning so certainly uh, uh they've got a heck of an opportunity to go have a special season 
What are you going to miss most about Oklahoma? I know it's not living here because the weather sucks right now. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's funny, my, my son, who's seven, he, for somehow, some way, we were, he was visiting me here in Columbia with my wife over the weekend, and the movie Twister was on. <laughs> and that's like his new favorite movie. He wanted me to record it in the condo that I'm living in, and he literally <laughs> every night wants to watch it. And I'm like, man, I'm glad you didn't watch that while we were living in Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, so the timing's good. Probably just the people. Uh, and I know that's easy to say, but, you know, I went there. Um, I went there for football reasons primarily, like I mentioned a minute ago, but mm -hmm. just the fantastic friends that that we made, you know, the great times that we had with, you know, Lincoln was great to work for. So I'm going to miss being a part of that football program and that building each and every day. But just the friends we made outside the football building, you know, Ryan Hibble and Zach Selman and their wives are friends for life that they've already planned trips to come out here this fall. And, and then just my wife is, my wife's a star of just being able to jump into any community and, and make friends. And she did a great job of that with so many people outside the athletic department, my kids, you know, I've got a middle daughter that doesn't want to move. She's mad at me and hardly speaks to me because we're moving. She doesn't want to leave Oklahoma. So probably that just the friends we made. And, and uh, it was cool for us as a family, just to kind of get out of our comfort zone and live in a different part of the country and be able to, you know, we always said we wanted to go to Hawaii to go to Hawaii because we lived a little bit closer to Hawaii than we did when we were living in Virginia or to go up to Colorado and just explore different places like that has been pretty cool. And final one, hypothetical here, and I think you'll enjoy this. Why should a recruit go play for Shane Beamer at the University of South Carolina? I think you start with South Carolina. Um, first of all, I mean, the academics here are, uh, you know, as good as anywhere. It's a fantastic place to go to school. Columbia is the capital city of South Carolina, so it's a great place to live. Unbelievable fan base close to 90,000 every single Saturday in williams Bryce Stadium, chance to play in the SEC. And then I just think that the, big, the thing that I've always been big on and always will be is just relationships with the players. And that's always been very important to me as an assistant coach. And it's going to be even more so now that I'm a head coach. So just the, the opportunity to come here and play big time football, get a great education, but enjoy being in this building. And, and I learned that from Lincoln. I mean, with everything that went on with COVID, he used to say it that look for our guys on our team, the time that they're able to come into the football building and go to meetings and go to practice, like that's probably going to be the most fun they have because most of the day they're isolated because of COVID. And, and that just always stuck with me where these guys that come into this building COVID or not, you know, we want this to be a place that they enjoy coming to each and every day. And that's the environment that we're trying to create in here right now with the staff. Well, one to the South Carolina people listening to this, I believe OC Marcus Satterfield mm -hmm. is connected with Joe Brady. So you plus there, uh, then you added what 10 assistants that had has have NFL backgrounds, which obviously another plus. Yeah. I thought about coming into this podcast and introducing Shane Beamer and hyping him up and being like coach, who's going to bang his head against the player's helmet coach. That's going to be crazy <laughs> on the sidelines. I promise you guys to the South Carolina people listening to this, He's what I hope there's a camera angle on every sideline and every game that Shane's in. He's going to have a ton of people watching in the Oklahoma City market, um, watching South Carolina football games. I can tell you that. And Shane, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's going to be uh, this was great. And I wish you best of luck. And you know that. And as well, one last thing. Just know I'm going to be watching. I'm going to find the stuff from Oklahoma in your tape. <laughs> I have no doubt. If, if anybody is able to, it is certainly you. Like I said, <laughs> ton of respect for your work and all you do and, and I learned a lot actually following you on Twitter myself so I look forward to continuing that as well and we got to get you guys out here for a game and I'll certainly be following the Sooners from South Carolina as well when I can also hey I got to get out to South Carolina and we got to I got to scout Georgia right that's my prediction for the 2021 season no I'm kidding Shane Absolutely. thank you so much no thank you appreciate it